Well, Leo, uh, glad you're uh, joining us today behind the Braves. Welcome to the Alumni Lounge. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, Mac. Yeah. I always enjoy spending a little time with you. Yeah, well, this, uh, <laughs> yeah, we've we've uh, gotten a chance to hang out more in the last probably 10 years since I've been working with the alumni. And, of course, you're up in South Carolina, but you're you're willing to come in and be a part of oh. what we're doing. We appreciate that. Well, it's a, we have a lot of great memories, and uh, uh, I have a lot of great memories when you were in our bullpen. And uh, it's just, a, a, you know, it's special to relive some of those moments. And uh, it was a once-in-a-lifetime deal, you know, and you, n- nobody's going to ever see that again. Uh, the success that we had. Well, I have to say this because, you know, Leo was a great teacher, a great coach uh, for all of us. But I, I'll have to say this. Leo impacted my career from uh, from being a baseball player, a young 26-year-old coming into the big leagues and never, never even been to big league camp. It was the first time I met Leo. And uh, I don't know if he remembers this, but Steve Bedrosian showed up two days early. I showed up two days early to West Palm Beach. Mm-hmm. And we, I'm in there. And of course, I didn't, I didn't know Steve. I didn't know Leo. I just, they invited me. Of course, you know, I was, I was uh, as eager as any young man sure. to be to, to get to Big League Camp. So I get to the ballpark. I thought, okay, well, I'll get the little lay of the land before everybody else gets there, knowing that uh, I was going to be seeing Maddox and Glavin and Smoltz and all these guys. And so out there, well, maybe I'll go in there early just to kind of see, make sure everything's not a surprise and just kind of hide in the corner a little bit. <laughs> but uh, Steve Bedrosian ended up showing up. Steve had, had just – it was making a comeback because mm-hmm. he had lost some feeling in his fingertips. And Steve was – his – you know, he'd taken maybe two years off, a year off. Yeah, he had had a year he, off. He'd been with Minnesota when we played them in, sure. in 91. So Steve was there, got a chance – he's a great guy. I got a chance to talk with him. Well, we actually – Get, Leo shows up and was there and said, hey, we're going to go out and play a little catch. And so I started throwing with Steve Bedrosian and did end up doing that for two years. But Leo was there, and, of course, he and he and, uh, he and Leo go way back. From we go way back. back I, in the 80s, I, had bed, I had bedrock in the, in the 80s, the late 80s, and he was the best arm that the organization had mm-hmm. at that time. And he was, he was an attacker, had one of the best fastballs I've ever seen. And uh, and he had a, a the makeup to go with it. He had a tremendous killer instinct. But he got my butt in trouble one time in Double A. <laughs> the manager decided to have the starting pitcher the next day chart in the stands. And I said, told the manager, I said, I don't think that's a very good idea. <laughs> he goes, No, no, no. He said they can see better from up there and all this and that. And I said, They should be in the dugout. But you're the manager, so Bedrock's got the first watch. You know, as far as doing the <laughs> doing the chart. The manager in about the third or fourth inning says, where's your starting pitcher at up there? And I said, well, I'm not paying attention to who's in the stands. I'm locked in on the game. He goes, well, he's not up there. I look around. We can't find him. He had left to go to the 7-Eleven <laughs> to, to, get a, to get a Coke and a candy bar and some dip, yeah. some Copenhagen. <laughs> and he just made up on the sheet then when he got back. And I said, well, I told you not to put any pitchers up there. Is that all the control you have over those guys? <laughs> so, anyway, I said, he put him back in the dugout. Yeah. <laughs> but, but he was tremendous. He had a, We had a great relationship, so. He was great. Yeah, he was a good, good guy. But I, I'll always remember that because we ended up becoming good friends and, and being able to pitch. But what I was going to say, that we could sit here and talk about bedrock stories all day long. Oh, my that's, golly. That's a whole podcast in and of yeah. itself. But uh, I will say that uh, Leo had a lot of impact on me as a young pitcher. But what I didn't realize is the impact you were going to have after I got out of the game and being a teacher. So one of the things that I've, I, I did for about 15 years is I instructed young kids from – eight to, to to minor leagues, and I've even got some guys <clears throat> that I worked with in the minor leagues and, and end up getting to the big leagues. But I, you impacted me more as an instructor than I believe that you did as a, a, as a young pitcher just because all the things that you taught me, um, I don't think they really took hold till after I was done playing from right. the standpoint of understanding them. So what you learned from Johnny Sane, and hopefully we'll get into that a little mm-hmm. bit <clears throat> today, but what you learned from him, you imparted to me, and they made it a great impact on me and all the other young kids I was able to impact as an instructor. So uh, I did want to tell you that. I appreciated that. And, and I know we've talked over the years just about pitching and instructing, yeah. too. Well, Mac, when, you know, you, you, in other words, you, all you needed was an opportunity. You know, I mean, we, we knew that you had a great change of speeds and that, that the way you threw change-ups in, in spring training, uh, we started loading you up against left-handed hitters. 
to see how they would react to your changeup, and it was the same thing. You know, they couldn't hit you. And that's basically one of the reasons why you made the club. But it was, it was because you, we could use you as a left-handed reliever even though you were right-handed, which if baseball people would do that more today, you wouldn't have to change so many damn pitchers. But anyway, um, uh, and then, you know, Tom Glavin said one time, he said, what, what I like about Leo, and this is not bragging, he teaches you how to teach yourself. You know, and, and that's basically what you do with pitchers. You, you, you know, you're constantly working with them and teach. But there's a lot of times when it doesn't sink in until – Later on, but then, I mean, the real meaning behind it, you still executed all your pitches and that like that. I really didn't teach you a whole lot. and basically gave you the opportunity to go out there and do your thing. And uh, a lot of times that's all somebody needs. And then when you talk pitching philosophies and you go back and forth and uh, on these types of things, then uh, it all registers and then you can pass it along. And that's a great point because I would always tell my students, I want to teach you to become your own best pitching coach. That's right. And that's when you know you've grasped. grasped that's a tough one. Grasp. I can't say it either. I can't say it either. Yeah. And I was trying to say musician the other day. I couldn't say that. As <laughs> <laughs> but that's when you know that you it's taken hold and that you have understood the concept and what, what you're trying to do if right. you can teach it to somebody else. But I realized that there was more uh, – there was a lot more to what I actually learned – because, you know, you get all wound up as a player sometimes. And you get focused just on your one thing. It's hard to try new things because right. you know you, you've got to do your best thing, you know, very well, and you got to stick with that. But then um, to really understand it, I think there's a maturing process that comes along. And I, I've never met a person that said, I wish I knew uh, now what I knew then. Or is that well, I wish got, I knew then well, what I know now? I, know I can't one, remember. It's I know one, one thing. I, I agree with you there 100% on that. <laughs> on, on, a, on, a certain, on a couple of things, yeah. namely, namely the Baltimore Orioles. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I'd have known now what I, what, <laughs> then what I know now. <laughs> That's right. That's oh, right. my golly. What a well, dummy I was. But anyway. It goes, goes along with hindsight's 2020. But, yeah, but uh, yeah, you know what? In the 42 years that. in this game, that's the only thing I ever second-guessed myself yeah. on in my entire career. So I guess that's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. And you went there was 06, I guess, 05, 06, you went to the Orioles. I don't even remember just anymore. Just trying to block that out. Blocked that out. Blocked blocked that out completely out of my brain. <laughs> well, we'll move on from that then. Yeah, so thanks. I, so, <laughs> well, first, <laughs> well, first of all, for me, it's a pleasure to have you, and thank you for taking the time to speak with us. So when I – when when Greg told me that you were going to come on with us. I dug into my archives, uh -oh. and I started doing a little research. Yeah. I, bu I bought this book. It's Leo Mazzoni's Tales from the Braves Mount. I yeah. bought it when, when you put it out years ago, Yeah. and I still have it. So I wanted to read this one oh, little no. blurb real quick. This is talking about the 1993 season. Uh, just one, st one sentence. One of the best things that happened for us that year was Greg McMichael. So my question is, how much did Greg McMichael pay you to write that in your book? He, he didn't, but I'll tell you one thing right now. When Mac was making a run at making our staff, Terry Pendleton came off the field one time after Mac had made some hitters look sick. And he looks at me and he goes, if you don't pick him, you're a fool. <laughs> he better be on the club, Mazzoni. And I said, hey, Bobby, did you hear that? I said, he – Terry says he's got to be on the club. He goes, now we'll convince Sherholtz of that. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Well, Which how, we did. Right. Well, that was – I mean, I'm joking, obviously, about the, the payment, I think. Uh, <laughs> um, but how early on in that spring, do you remember the first time he started? Because in the book you describe how he went from field two right. and made the jump to field one. Do you remember mm -hmm. the first time you kind of laid eyes on him and thought, hmm, we might have something? Well, here's, here's what I always felt as a pitching coach. When you had guys on field one and field two, the, everybody got a chance to pitch. I didn't want – designating pitchers to back up for a week, which they had they did with me when I was a young pitcher, and you had to sit there. Oh, you guys are backing up every day, and then nobody would work with you. And if somebody got hammered, they'd bring you in for an inning or two. My job to me was to have everybody have an opportunity to pitch in spring training because you never know what you might find. The reason guys are in a big league camp is to pitch. So, therefore, I would always make sure that everybody got in the game. So, even though he was on field two, we had him penciled in for an exhibition game just like we would on pitchers on field one. Mm -hmm. And then when he got in there, nobody was getting any hits. So, then Bobby would say, move him up a little closer to the beginnings of the game before we stretched out our starters so that we can see him against better hitters because by the end of the game, all the minor league guys were playing. Mm-hmm. So then we kept moving him up closer and moving him up closer. And then he says, now let's set it up to where uh, we have him face left-handed hitters. Well, he faced left-handed hitters against the Mets and the Yankees. And he made them look sick. And that's when Terry Pendleton came out. He goes, hey, Leo, hey, Leo, hey, Leo. <laughs> you, know, you guys are crazy if you don't pick him on the staff. <laughs> and that's how it, ev it evolved. But you have to have the opportunity to mm -hmm. do that. Right. And you know what? I always felt it was our job to take the best 20 – best. 
10 pitchers. How many do they take now? 15? Which is a joke, by the way. Anyway, <laughs> so anyway, they take, they take with the best 10 pitchers, take them north, right? Mm-hmm. Well, he was one of the best 10. I didn't worry about, well, let's see. This guy, if we take him up now, he's going to be arbitration eligible then, or this guy, da da. But thank God we had a guy like Bobby Cox who carried a lot of weight, mm-hmm. and Bobby was able to convince up the people upstairs that he, was a, he should be on our staff. And so that's how we got it done. We got it done, and then the rest is history because he became one of the top relievers we had and pitched in the most crucial one-run games, I think, in, in, our, in our great run. Yeah, that was, <clears throat> that was some great memories. Of course, you know, we can talk all day about pitching, but one of the things I really would like for you to talk about was your career as a pitcher because, mm-hmm. um, you know, I've seen some photos. I, I've, seen, I've read some of the stories and I've heard you talk a little bit about it, but tell tell us ab- about you, Leo Mazzoni, as a, as a pitcher, going back to you know just you got that four hundred dollar paycheck to yeah. uh, that bonus that you got to go out and start pitching, and you had a good career in the minor leagues. I really did. I mean, it was, there was no room at the end. I was with the uh, San Francisco Giants and the Oakland A's, and 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 my first year out, uh, or signed out of high school, my dad put me on a plane in Pittsburgh, and I grew up in Western Maryland, West Virginia area, and. Uh, my first trip away from home was to San Francisco. So I, I thought we were going to land in the Bay. I was scared to death. And then I, <laughs> then I had to go up to Oregon because I was going to pitch in the Northwest League. Well, we had – we get up to Oregon, and they have two teams up there, Medford, Oregon, which is Class A, and Salt Lake City, which was a rookie league. So you had high school and college pitchers there, you know. So we, we faced each other. They had exhibition games. And I would look on the board, and I said, where's my name? And they said, well, you're pitching Saturday – you got the fourth and fifth innings. And so, anyway, the first six hitters I faced, I struck out five of them. And Hank Sauer, who was the old-time manager then, had a, hit a lot of home runs with the Giants. And he goes, here we go, Mac. Here's the little man. Hey, little man. I went, oh, geez. Because <laughs> I struck out five of the six guys. He goes, you know, for a little guy, you throw really good. And I said, you see those other two big so-and-sos over there? He goes, yeah. I said, I throw better than them, too. <laughs> and so, anyway, I made the Class A team when I was supposed to go to the Rookie League and made the starting rotation. Well, I pitched there, and I, I pitched 90 innings there, and then I ended up going to A-ball in Decatur, Illinois, which I won 15 games and completed 18 of them. And I was only 19 years old. So, at age 20, I was a triple-A. I'd skipped double A, and I was with a triple A team in spring training, and I was still there on March the 25th. Mm. And you know that's pretty much getting close to breaking with the club. And my dad calls me, and he says, Leo, he goes, uh, you got to leave. I said, what's the matter? He goes, you just got called up by the big club. I said, what big club? He goes, the Army. And I had to go. I had to go to. I left spring training. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, went to Fort Jackson, South Carolina for infantry school. Went to Fort Gordon, Georgia for military police school and missed the whole year. Wow. And then, and I went, you got to be kidding me. Then I went to double A and I had a great year in double A. Went back to double A with a bad attitude Hmm. and didn't do so well. So I was shipped to Mexico. So now my name is Leonardo David Massoni, <laughs> and I'm pitching for the Monterey Sultanis of the Mexican League. And I thought, that's when I thought, you know what, maybe this ain't for me. Well, <laughs> yeah. you know, but I, I didn't care. I went down there and pitched, and then the, 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 the team down there said, uh, you have to leave Mexico. And I said, what's the matter? You've been picked up. You're going to Birmingham, mm. Oakland A's. Now I go to Birmingham with the Oakland A's, and that's when they converted me into a reliever. Then that's when I was in Tucson, and then that's when I got called to the big league camp with the world champion Oakland A's. Mm. So then I was close to making the world champion Oakland A's because the left-handed relievers were Daryl Knowles and Paul Limblad. The closer was was uh, Raleigh Fingers, by the way. Mm. And the starters were Catfish Hunter, Blue Moon Odom, Kenny Holtzman, you know, Vita Blue. Now, you decent know, careers. I mean, come on. just decent, a, Yeah, you know, decent careers. Okay. World <laughs> champions. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, three years in a row, and I'm trying to make the staff. So I came close, and then Lindblad, with, with 10 days to go, Paul Lindblad comes down to the bullpen to take my spot to go into a particular game, and I went, mm. boy, I hope his arm falls off. <laughs> I hope his elbow <laughs> blows out. And it didn't, and I was sent down. Oh, man. And that's as close as I got. But <clears throat> thankfully for the Oakland A's, Sid Thrift was the farm director. And in the spring training of 1976, he said, Leo, we need to have a meeting with you. So he called me in with the organization. Me, uh, the, the farm director scouts and all that, and they said, we think you're coaching material. 
And I said, I think so, too. Down the road, I'm looking forward to it. He goes, Leo, we think you're coaching material. <laughs> I went, uh-oh, this means now. He goes, it means now. Oh, man. And I went, I pitched. he said, you've pitched 10 years. You've pitched 1,000 innings in the minor leagues, and you have not made it to the big leagues yet. Odds are you're not going to get mm. there. And we, think we'd li- we have a team down in Corpus Christi, Texas, and we'd like you to go down there, fly down there, meet with the uh, owner down there, and uh, uh, manage this cr- Class A Corpus Christi team. And, you know, and I went, so I took two, they said, take two days off and try to figure out what you want to do. So I decided to take the team because uh, manage, go manage the club because I felt that if I was in the same boat the year before, mm-hmm. I might not have nowhere to go, and then I don't know what I would do with the rest of my life because from the time I was nine years old, it was only baseball. Nothing else even came, mm-hmm. entered my mind. Mm-hmm. And so I took the team, and we won a championship <laughs> there. The biggest thing I had to learn was how to write out a lineup card and and go to the umpire and go, let's see, which copy does he get? <laughs> <laughs> so I was I was the uh, pitching coach, the hitting instructor, the manager, and the third base coach. Wow. I did that in Corpus Christi in 1976. I did it again there in 1977, and we won there again. Then Major, uh, uh, major League Baseball asked me to go to Kinston, North Carolina, to manage this co-op team. Well, the Braves optioned eight players – to Kinston for the co-op team in the Carolina League. And then I got some from the Phillies and the Yankees and every. So anyway, so now I'm going to manage this team. Well, of the eight pitchers, five um, of the eight players the Braves optioned out, five of them were pitchers, and three of them ended up in the top ten in the league in pitching. And so then the Braves started snooping around and wondering what happened. You know, so Paul Snyder and Hank Aaron started taking notice of, who's this guy, you know, managing this Class A team? These pitchers, we couldn't do nothing with them here, but this guy's – you know, they're good. a couple of them are going to make the All-Star team. And so they came in, and, and, and one scout said uh, to, to Paul Snyder, and he said, look, he said, uh, this team isn't very good, but that manager has up, raised the bar on their, their talent level. And so at the end of the year, I went home, figuring I was coming back to Kinston again the next year, and the phone rang, and it was uh, Hank Aaron's secretary. And said, Mr. Aaron would like to talk to you. And I said, okay. And he says, Leo, this is this is Hank Aaron. I said, yes, sir. He goes, how would you like to fly down to Sarasota with me and look at some of our pitchers in the instructional league? Uh, we're thinking of offering you a full-time job with the Braves. I said, when you want me there? He said, when can you come? I said, I can come tomorrow. He goes, okay, we'll send you out a t- we'll get you a ticket and you meet me at the airport in Atlanta and you and I'll fly down to Sarasota. So now I'm meeting Hank Aaron at the airport after all these years. Flying down to Sarasota. So I'm on the plane with him. Of course, you know, with Hank, we're in first class, right? He goes, hey, Leo, you want a beer? Went, sure, I'll have one. <laughs> <laughs> I was nervous. Yeah. So Hank and I have a beer and land in Sarasota. And the next day, I'm out there look, watching all the pictures. And after a week, he says, who's the number one guy we got out here? Well, Mackle like this. You know who it was? Steve Vedrosian. I said, that's the oh, best well. arm you got. And this was Bedrock's, you know, f- first or second year in the league. So, anyway, he said, we'd like to offer you a job. I said, what team do you want me to manage? He goes, no, 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 no. He said, we want you as a pitching coach. And I said, okay. So, then Detroit called and said they wanted me to manage Lakeland in the Florida State League. Well, the, the Braves offered more as a pitching coach than Detroit did as a manager. So, I said, well, this is an easy decision. <laughs> I'm going to take the pitching coach job. So, I, w- I was their pitching coach for uh, – uh, and I was there – up to 1986, when Bobby Cox became the general manager, that's when I started to pick up, as they call it, some juice in the organization. Mm-hmm. But I had met Johnny Sane prior to that, and he was the greatest pitching coach in the history of baseball, and he took me under his wing when nobody else wanted his information because people fear knowledge. And, and you know, he was with the Yankees for three years. They went to the World Series. He went to Minnesota for three years, went to the World Series. Detroit for three years, went to the World Series, and finished up in Chicago. And now I can't figure out how come he's the minor league pitching coordinator. And, you know, I'm thinking, what's he doing here, you know, with all that, with that track record? Well, I found out later that he was so smart. He was smarter than the people that were running the organizations, and he was smarter than the manager in the dugout, and nobody liked that. He had too much success. Well, I thought – if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna, you know, pick a pick a brain apart, you know, that has the most success in the history of baseball, all those World Series titles, 15, 20 game winners. So every night he w- he wouldn't even stay at a hotel. Every night he'd take me to a trailer in West Palm Beach, and we'd sit there and he he'd make up some cornbread and beans. He'd get a little vodka out, 
We'd sip on some vodka, eat cornbread, and talk about pitching. And I sat there and went. I just shut up and listened. And I thought, man, oh, man, this guy's way ahead of his time here. Mm -hmm. And all the programs that you saw enacted when I became a minor league pitching coach and then in the major leagues, a lot of it was Johnny Sainisms and some of his programs. But Johnny was in a four-man rotation, and I had to go into a five. So I, I adapted by having guys throw that extra day in between, and it worked like a charm. But it was amazing how many people did not like Johnny Sain. You know why? He was a little bit of a rebel. Mm -hmm. He wanted pitchers to throw a lot and run a little. Mac, what I want pitchers to do? Throw a lot and run a little. I didn't care. The guys would say, how many you want me to run? So, <laughs> how do you think that would have impacted you as a pitcher if you had oh, had I, Johnny saying I would have changed speeds more instead of trying to strike people yeah. out. So I was wondering what kind of pitcher you were and how that oh, I, would have impacted oh, you. Oh, I, think, I think that would have got me over the hump because you know, I, was, I was good. I got close, but I think if, 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 if that changeup would have been more of a weapon for me. Mm. But at the time in my brain, I thought breaking balls were better than change-ups. And I come to learn over the period of time, I would take the change up ahead of the breaking ball as far as your everyday pitcher. You know, now if you had a breaking ball like Smoltz's, I mean, come on. Yeah. You know, but then Smoltz, he couldn't throw a change up. So we had to teach him a split. Well, when I taught him a split, who do you think I went to first before I taught him a split? I met with Bruce Souter. Said, give me all the information you got on the split so that I don't mess Smoltz up, you know. But anyway, so I learned this over the years. But I was just, you know, pitching coach in A ball, double A, you know, this and that. Then Bobby Cox becomes the general manager. And then that's when he says, I'm turning an offensive-oriented organization into a pitching one. Who's going to take care of the pitchers? Well, I raised my hand, you know. And I was telling – he just explained to us and everybody in the room, the entire organization, the old Fulton County Stadium, explained to us how you're going to do it. And I explained to him how we're going to do it. Now, I was with Bobby Cox in 79, 80, and 81. I was there to throw BP all the time to Murphy, Horner, and Chambliss. And, that, and, and, so, and then with Joe Torrey was there. I'm sorry, yeah, with Torrey. And then I was with Bobby before that. Well, you know, Bobby and I sat in a, on a floor watching the uh, uh, United States beats Russia in hockey that night. We were all sitting there drinking beer and screaming like crazy. But anyway. <laughs> so anyway, so I told him how we were going to explain it. And so Jim Beecham and I were man, man was a manager there, and Beach and Bobby Deuce they raised their hands and said, "Can we say something, Bobby?" And, and Bobby Cox said, "Yeah." He goes, "Well, I've Leo's been a pitching coach for both of us." And he said, "Our guys never got no sore arms. We made all our starts. That's the only way you became a pitching coach. Then you became a pitching coach if your rotation stayed healthy." I guess that's out the window now, but I guess now you have to be able to punch in a computer and look at an iPad for crying out loud. But anyway, so anyway, <laughs> so now we have another pitching coach that stands up, and I won't mention his name because it's not important, but he did get to the big leagues for a little bit. And he stood up and he says, well, as much as Mazzoni wants these pitchers to throw, he said there will be nothing left in, in August. So I said, can, can I ask a question? And they said, yeah, go ahead. I said, well, when I have my guys throw that extra day in between on the mound, what do you do? He said, well, I have them throw flat-footed throwing in the outfield. And I said, well, why don't you explain the difference to me then between flat-footed throwing in the outfield and pitching off of a mound going downhill 60 feet, 6 inches to a catcher? Because that's how you make your living. He says, they'll have a tendency to throw too hard. I said, that's what the hell they pay you for is to regulate the effort. Boom. Everybody sat down. So after a period of time, then Bobby said, okay, Leo's programs are in place. That's when I started to – that was in 1986. So that's when I started to pick up some juice, as they say, in the minor leagues. But then once again, I was in double A. Our rotations never missed any starts. I was in triple A for a couple years. They didn't. Nobody missed any starts. So then June of 1990 – uh, when we were having all this success. The, Smoltz had developed. Avery was developing. Mike Stanton, Kent Merker, uh, and I'm sure I'm missing a couple. Pete Smith. Mm -hmm. Pete Smith pitched, come off of a sore arm in Philadelphia, pitched 180, 178 innings in Greenville, and went to the big leagues without going to AAA. Can you imagine somebody pitching 178 innings mm -hmm. in AA now? <laughs> you can't even get them to do that in the big leagues anymore, for yeah. crying out loud. But anyway, so all these things came into place, right? Well, Bobby and I would work together. We, we got so he calls me up. He says we got Smoltz in a trade, so you know we we he said take him down there and figure him out in Sarasota. So I'm, John and I are down in the backfield. He goes take care of all the other. Let the other guys take care of those other guys. 
well, we're on the backfield. And you know how we, you know how John Smoltz got started? We're down there throwing, and after the fourth pitch, he goes, oh, that's not right, that's not right, that's not right. And I said, what's not right? I haven't said nothing yet. We're just getting started. And he goes, well, I'm in Detroit. I said, you're not in Detroit no more. I said, would you do me a favor? He goes, what's that? I said, would you wind up and throw the ball the way you want to? He goes, okay. So he winds up and throws the ball the way he wants to without thinking about his mechanics. It was absolutely one of the most beautiful deliveries you ever want to see. Then when I told him that's perfect, he goes, he didn't believe me. So anyway, he went on to do that. Good fastball, good breaking ball, and developed him. <clears throat> to make a long story short, Bobby said, how did you do that? How did you get him squared away? I said, I let him be himself. Didn't go into detail about another side. Mm-hmm. Oh, he do this, do that, that, that. You know, he did it, but I let him be himself. So these were all things that were occurring in my f- leading up to the big leagues. And then finally in June of 1990, June 22nd, Bobby said, I need you to be in Atlanta. And I said, okay, what's going on? He goes, well, you're the big league pitching coach. So after 24 years in the minor leagues, he names me the big league pitching coach. And he says, you got any questions? I said, yeah, I got one. He goes, what's that? I said, who's the manager? He goes, me. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's a great story. And I, I'm just curious, you know, how that had to feel, especially after you said 24 years. I mean, a couple over two decades in, in the minor leagues trying to make it both as a player and then you're in a coach and you're mm-hmm. in – Every town all over the United States and Mexico. I mean, right. all over North America, for crying out loud. I mean, so when you finally get that, that shot in the big leagues, how was that? What was that? How you know, did that feel? I, I thought I was going to scream and holler and go bananas, and I was completely the opposite. Because Bobby says, don't go crazy. I know how emotional you can get. He says, don't go crazy. He says, where are you at? I said, I'm in the lobby here in Buffalo with the team and Jim Beecham. And he goes, don't go crazy. I said, Bobby, I'm perfectly fine. I'm very calm. He goes, really? I said, yeah. He goes, well, I said, okay, and I and I, so I I didn't do nothing crazy. I went to the traveling secretary in Richmond. And I said I need a flight to. He goes, I already know. I got all the details, and so the next day I got to Atlanta, and uh, uh, Bobby Cox was there to meet me at the door, and he said, Leo, he said, I don't care what you do here. He said, just take care of your pitchers. Mm-hmm. Now I've had two 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 people in my life tell me that. Actually, three. Jim Beecham. Hank Aaron, and Bobby Cox. And all they said was this, Leo, I don't care what you do. There's your pitchers. I don't care what you do. Take care of them. I didn't have nobody have to tell me how to take care of anybody, and I didn't need a, need a statistic to tell me that. You know, I did it from all the knowledge that I'd learned over the years, and I found out over the years prior to getting to the big leagues that I had three, two or three great teachers in my career. I had about 250 that were lousy, that weren't any good. And that's what I was going to make sure that I didn't act like they acted or think the way they thought because it was such a – you know, when you get to the minor leagues and you're, you're as a pitching coach and as a group, I thought you all worked together to produce a product and get them to the big leagues, right? Mm-hmm. No, it wasn't. It was all the coaches jockeying for a position to get credit for it. And I went, you got to be kidding me. But you learn that as you go. You know, and then you find out, well, wait a minute, what's reality here and what isn't? And I had made, I was going to make sure that I was going to do it. The programs that I believed in, the pictures that I believed in, that I was going to express my opinion. And I was told a couple times, there's nothing wrong with expressing your opinion, but could you be a little more diplomatic? Right. <laughs> <laughs> right, Mac? That's right. <laughs> but anyway, that's, that was all part of it. And then as, then as the seasons progressed, you know, the thing I'm most proud of was the health of our pitching staffs and, and, and the guys being able to make all their starts. Can you imagine? And he brought it up at, when I was putting the Atlanta Sports Hall of Fame. 537 starts and you only miss one. And then, you, then in 15 years, your starting rotation makes like 146 of the 162 game scheduled starts on average. Well, come on. Number one, the manager – has a whole lot to do with that. And Bobby Cox is in the Hall of Fame because of the way he handled pitchers. That's his number one thing that he, he knew how to do. He gave them respect. You know, you ever hear Magic, ah, put him on the backfield so we can get some work done around here. You know, I ran into those guys my whole career. And you know what those guys did? They lost. They oh, never won. I was going to say got fired, but I guess yeah, it's the No, they the lost, and then they yeah. got fired. Yeah, okay. And I'm thinking, <laughs> but they're still, you know, oh, you know, Johnny Macho Man and all this sort of thing, you know. But Bobby wasn't like that. Now, Bobby could let you know real quick what's going on every once in a while, even me. And he told me a few things every once in a while myself. But <laughs> but anyway, uh, 
So that and then to just continue that over a long period of time is just it's phenomenal. And but I had with Bobby Cox and Johnny Sane and Jim Beecham, uh, I had a, a great great background and wonderful people. Mm-hmm. Well, we have we have a little bit in common just because they had the Kinston connection because that was one of the first teams I ever played for. That's a bad town, isn't it? <laughs> no, it isn't. It's good. I shouldn't say that. They put me in their Hall of Fame. The yeah, Kinston Hall of Fame. Yeah, I was going to say so, they inducted you. Know, but it's a you know you have to be prepared to. Uh, uh, get a whole new type of education as mm-hmm. far as uh, how advanced people, uh, yeah. you know, the, the the towns are and the people in them. Yeah, and that's kind of your your typical my, small minor league baseball right. town, which they're all over the South right. and Texas and all that kind of sure. stuff. And um, but I do I do remember that um, uh, you know you brought up the Atlanta Sports Hall of Fame, which you were inducted in a mm-hmm. couple of years ago, and you I and got, Charlie were great got, by the way. Got to be a, I appreciate that. Got to be a part of that. That was a, a real treat to be able to induct you into that. And um, you've had a lot of accolades in your career. I mean, you've been to All Star Games. You've uh, you've had you know you were at the Hall of Fame when the three. Oh, you know, we've been up there four years in a yeah, row, Mac. When, yeah, you know, and uh, hopefully maybe Murphy can get in on the Veterans Committee, and maybe uh, Fred McGriff can get in. You know, but to be go up there for Bobby and the three starters and sure holds. Mm-hmm. I mean, come on. I mean, yeah. in one decade. Yeah, I know it's pretty amazing. Oh my golly! I bet people are sick of Cooperstown. I'm sick of looking at Braves people now. <laughs> right. <laughs> but obviously, um, Glav and Smoltzy and and Doggy, they all talk highly of you. They they mentioned you in their speeches, and um, that was a big treat. And um, obviously, we have in common the 14 straight division titles, yeah. which we've got a World Series champion. You've written a book. You've done a lot of things, but what do you what do you spend your time? And I've heard you you've you've been speaking about the game, mm-hmm. speaking about pitching, and that's and do you feel like that that's your way of giving back of what's going on with health? Because you took a lot of pride in our health. That's right. That's yeah. the only thing. I didn't care about nothing else. I didn't. I never told nobody how many games to win or how. Many. Look, when it's your turn to go to the post, you go to the you go to the post, and the rest will take care of itself. If it's your turn to make an appearance and you can make that appearance, the rest takes care of itself. And I, that was the thing that I was most proud of. It was amazing. You know, and you tell people that, and they go, oh, you can only do that because you had those three guys. There was a hell of a lot more than three guys over a 15-year, 14-year run. But that's, you know what that is? I heard the same people tell that to Sane. I heard the same people. My career paralleled his so much, like, toward the end of my career. I would you know, nobody was knocking down my door either. They didn't knock down Sane's either because people fear knowledge and People say, feel that you're so strong in your opinions and you know that you're going to voice them and you're not going to be a yes man, and that's why they don't want to invite you in. No. But, but you, anyway. But you found other ways to give back. Absolutely. Yep. You've worked with um, – tell them about uh, – Oh, uh, uh, Doug Sinella up in New yep. York. We had a we had a, a coach's seminar uh, two weeks ago talking about healthy arms. I met with Dr. Ahmad, the Yan- Yankee doctor, uh, Tommy John himself. I've I've done, done clinics in uh, uh, seminars in Waco, Texas, Columbus, Ohio, uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, getting the message out to the coaches and to the f- parents that 52% of all Tommy John surgeries now are 19 years of age and under. Hmm. The great. term velocity is totally ruining pitchers' arms. If you're a, a teenage pitcher, there's nothing wrong with throwing a baseball year-round. There is something wrong with throwing competitively year-round when you're only 13, 14, 15, 16 years old. Now, we used to go to winter ball, but I was 8, 9, 8 19, and 20 years old when I went to winter ball. But now the, and then, then the kids are being told that if you don't make a team, I mean, if you don't hit a certain number on a radar gun, you don't make the club. What are they going to try to do? They're going to try to jack it up. Smoltzy and I have always, we, you, if you hear both of us talk, we're trying to get the radar gun eliminated up through high school, which is never going to happen. This velo thing, is, it, it's getting ridiculous. Our entire health, when Mac talks about the pitching staffs, whether it was in the minor leagues, in A ball, or the big leagues all the way through October, was more often with less exertion. Mm-hmm. More often, less exertion. Throw more often, less exertion. You know what it is now? Less often and as hard as, and much exertion as you can dish out, which is the totally opposite of, of what you want to do to protect a pitcher's arm. 
You know, it's the amount of effort you put on a particular pitch. And we used to control the effort. If you wanted to – matter of fact, he didn't do it much because he, had a, he was in so many games. But a guy like Bedrock, he'd, come, he'd be waiting on me down in the pen and go, I haven't been in the game in seven days. I said, good, that means our starters are doing well. He goes, I don't want to hear that. Let's go down. I'm going to air it out. I said, come on, but if you air it out, I'm gonna, I'm, we ain't going to do it no more. And, and so, anyway, but those are the, that's how we did it. You know, mm-hmm. and then the other thing was, and I, I've had I've had talks with so many people, Mac. And they don't. This is something they don't know. Bobby Cox had what they call a max out inning, and a max out inning was this: Leo, is he going to max out this inning? Yep, Bobby, he's going to max out. If he maxes out, that means a reliever's coming in the next inning. Re- I don't care about the pitch count. And if he wasn't going to max out and he was being successful, then he stayed in. And then I, I had the clicker, right, before they put him up on the wall. I cheated on that clicker. Say, glad through a first pitch changeup, and the guy popped it up. I said, no, I, ain't, I ain't counting that. <laughs> and so I would be like 10 under with the normal number, you know. And it got to be a joke where Bobby would say, is that the real number or is it yours, you know. <laughs> or with Smoltzy, I talked him into a complete game one time. I talked Merker into his no-hitter in L.A. He said, I'm tired. I said, what, are you nuts? He goes, what do you mean? I said, look up on the scoreboard. <laughs> that's what I was going to bring that up because yeah. there's a great blurb in the book yeah. um, uh, that I was because re- I read it again years ago when I got it. Sure. And the, but when we found out we were going to have you, I went through and was reading it again. It was great to go through those stories again. And that stuck out to me as one of my favorites was not only did he come in and say he was tired. It was like once you told him to look at that scoreboard, all of a sudden he wasn't feeling he wasn't so tired, tired anymore. anymore. Yeah. So and I tell people this, so you know, because. You know, we've already had four or five pitchers this year that had no hitters going. They took them out after 80 pitches or whatever, you know, that they do now, which is totally ridiculous. And so, Merker threw 130 pitches in that game. He only pitched 17 years after that. 17 years. Right. You know? I mean, it it insults your intelligence when you have to listen about how some of these pitchers are handled today. The one thing they're taking away from pitchers is innings pitched. In the minor leagues, they're taking that away from them, innings pitched. The managers and pitching coaches pretty much don't have much power anymore. It's all being run from up, up top, you know. And so, you know, it, it, it gets a little frustrating for me, even though I'm fine with my career and I'm fine. I don't want you know, but going back in is no – I don't want to do any of that no more. I got a beautiful house on a lake with three dogs and my beautiful wife. So, you know, what I – but to, I sometimes – you know what she, my wife will tell me? What are you watching it for? All it does is make you mad. <laughs> She'll hear me in the other room going, what the? <laughs> what are they doing? They're taking him out and he's throwing good? Yeah. And I had, I had an organization say, what do you call, what do you think about the pitcher, you know, facing the lineup third time around the order and they take him out? That's the manager covering his butt. You know, you and it, because because if they if they take him out, they're saying, well, he's fine. But then the the the, the relief the bullpen blows it, right? But if they leave him in and he gives up a run, well, you know, your analytics say, you know, there, I believe there's a place for some analytics in the game. Of course there is, but that can't be how it's all based on. You know, you, you've got to. There's still. I love what Bruce Bochy said about why he's retiring. He said, I've always managed from my gut, and guess what? He's probably being told now not to do that. Mm-hmm. You know. So all these things come into play, but no, get, I'm getting off track a little bit. But the great careers, the healthy arms, all that, I'm, you know, that that's what I'm most proud of. Mm-hmm. And there, you know, guys like McMichael, my, J- Jeremy Guthrie, guy man in, in Baltimore, and Eric mm-hmm. Bedard in Baltimore, and mm-hmm. of course Jarrett Wright. You can the list goes on and on. Mm-hmm. I saw a rotation one day, Mac, and not people realize this, but you know, it was Russ Ortiz, John Thompson, Mike Hampton. Rocio Ramirez, and we won then too. Mm-hmm. Like 03, 04. Yeah, those guys, those, yeah. those guys won. I mean, they had all – all, we had like five, four or five guys, four, five, 15 game winners or four, whatever. Mm-hmm. But you know what? You can't do that unless you make all your starts. And you have to – let me tell you something. You think John Smoltz would be in the Hall of Fame if Bobby Cox would have taken him out of the rotation in 1991 with a 2-11 and 11 record? You don't know what would have happened. Right. Mm-hmm. That's why he's in the Hall of Fame. You know what Bobby Cox said? Best two and eleven pitcher I ever seen. Mm-hmm. That's what I remember him when when Kelly Johnson came up uh, in '05, I believe it was mm-hmm. with the with the Baby Braves. I think he started like I don't know if it was over thirty, but it was something. I like was over there. 30. Yeah, and I remember Bobby saying, quoted in the media saying, you know, because he kept playing him, and he said, uh, 
It's it's the best 0 for 30 I've ever seen. That's right. And he, sure enough, he was swinging the ball. Absolutely. I mean, he swinging well, and he Everybody, finally gave yeah, his chance. I was there, right. and you know, he said that, he said he's got a beautiful swing. I ain't gonna say, you know, let him let him hit. Um, but the patience today for that is is non-existent. Mm-hmm. You right. know, you have you know, you if you want to develop pitchers, you got to let them pitch. You got to give them innings. Pitch is their greatest teacher. But um, <clears throat> yeah. And, oh, and the other thing they asked me when I was out in in in, in Scottsdale was. Um, uh, Leo, what do you think of uh, <clears throat> a pitcher? What we used to do, they said in San Diego, was get three feet in front of the mound and throw throw to the catcher, you know. And I said, well, why'd you get and throw thirty pitches? That was your practice in between. I said, number one, why would you throw three feet in front of the mound when you make your living at sixty feet six inches? And number two, why would you put a number of thirty pitches on it when he may be done before that, or he may need a few extra after that? What do you do? Just put down thirty pitches, regardless of how many he throws? I'm sure you do because that's the organizational rule, you know. Things like this. I mean, where's your innovation? Where's your, where's your thinking? Where's your, uh, you know, uh, where's your uh, creativity. open mind? creativity? Where, where, you know, you got to have that. You can't, you know, I don't see no, hardly any bullpens throw much anymore. And when they do, they throw as hard as they can. Mm-hmm. Smoltzy, t- t- he told DeGrom that, didn't he? D- you know, hey, you're throwing as hard as you can in between starts when, you know, you should be throwing more often and not as hard. Yeah, and I, I think when I look back at, of course, I've observed from a distance, teaching, watching the game, playing the game. I think it all started when, when the Tommy Johns started happening and they couldn't explain it. I think they didn't really want to look too deep on why it was happening. I have my own philosophy on why that happened. But I think they had to come up with a reason. And the reason was, okay, guys are throwing uh, too much, too hard, so we need to limit those things. And so we're going to – you know, the, they went the opposite direction. Right. And they didn't really investigate that, well, maybe it's because kids are playing too That's early. Right. Maybe they're playing too often. And, and then the philosophy of they're playing – there's no feel and touch. There's no, um, there's no, you know, spin. Yeah, you spin the ball here, taking it off, putting it on. It became. It's all about power. It became about the radar gun because we know that if you sit there and try to throw as hard as you can all the time, your velocity is going to continue is going to go up. And so it's just a mindset, but it's really not. That's not pitching. No. That's more throwing. And so I think it coupled with. The Tommy Johns, they just created some of these artificial limits and, and thought that that would uh, cure it, which we know that it hasn't. Oh, I They're think. still having it. I mean, think about all the pitchers yet. I mean, I'm in in my career thinking about I knew of maybe uh, – I know one one or two guys had Tommy John. It wasn't like it was like you, you were going to – your career is going to be over because your rotator, rotator cuff. Rotator cuff, yeah. Not, not about your right. ligament blowing, and then that's just totally – Totally changed. No, I, so I agree with you 100%, culture. Mac. I agree with you 100%. And, and, and the thing is, it's for 14- and 15-year-olds. You know, and then a lot of kids are being told now not to play another sport. Go out and play another sport. When baseball season's over, go play whatever you're going to play. Mm-hmm. You know, basketball, football, uh, 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 whatever you want to play. It doesn't matter. But to play competitively year-round as a young kid is ridiculous. And then – the first thing that comes out of anybody's mouth when I'm talking to parents, oh, he's up to 80, he's up to 81. I didn't ask you that. I, you know, I asked you, what? look, if you teach kids to be sneaky quick instead of overpowering, you're going to be just as fast, you're going to locate better, and it'll calm down your mechanics. Mm-hmm. But these are all things that you learn over 42 years in the game. Mm-hmm. Right. But you did, I didn't learn those until I met Johnny Sane. Mm-hmm. Before, I thought – I. I had to go for strikeouts. You know, that's that was your mentality then. Your mentality also was if you were a starting pitcher and you didn't go nine, you didn't have a good outing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know. Well, let's talk about a couple uh, current guys who yeah. I think you would really like. Have you watched got the chance to watch Soroka pitch? Yeah. Got got calm, cu- uh, calm as a cucumber yeah. too. Power mm-hmm. sinker. Yeah. Changes speeds. I like him. He gets ground balls. Yeah, I like him a lot I because the defense likes him too. Well, when you watch him <laughs> pitch, it doesn't look he doesn't make you tired. You know what I mean? You ever watch a guy and, boy, you get tired just watching him. Mm-hmm. I've told pitchers that before. I said, man, you're making me tired. And I'm sure, you know, I can imagine how you feel. <laughs> <laughs> just a little just a little shove and yeah, nudge every once in a while. You're right. making me really tired today, guys. <laughs> 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 but anyway, anyway, so, yeah, I love the way he throws. I love the way Sean Newcomb throws. Mm-hmm. I would love to have him, too. I think that, uh, you know, he, he's got a chance to be real good. And, uh, you know, the – my my feeling is you got to you know you get your five that you really think are your best and d- try not to mm-hmm. interchange them 
you know, yeah. ride them out. You know, he keep keep handing them the ball. Here's something you haven't heard. You guys haven't heard. At the end of the 1990 season, you know, the Braves finished last. Bobby and I got there June 22nd. I gave the pitching staff a goal to get a staff here from June 22nd till the end of the year to be under four because it was at five something when we got there. We almost got under. We almost got it to under four, but we got it like 402. <clears throat> so at the the last game of the season, Bobby Cox said, "Leo, he said I want you to have the starting rotation come to the dugout at two o'clock in the afternoon before everybody gets here." I said, "Okay." He said, "Have him in uniform." Da da da. Here comes Tom Glavin, John Smoltz, Steve Avery, Pete Smith, and Charlie Lee Brandt. That was our five guys. So you had four really young guys and one veteran. He says he calls them and he goes, look, he says, uh, I want you five guys to know when we go to spring training next year, you're the five starters. He said, you're the five starters regardless of what the end result is in spring training. I want you to get your mindset to the fact that you're the five starters and you five starters are going to pitch to – Every time, every fifth day, until it's till we're done as to how and how far we get. That's what he did before. Those five guys. You think they had some bad games over the period? Well, they might have had two or three in a row. You never know. Mm-hmm. All five of them started, and all five of them took us to the seventh game of the World Series. And it's and you referenced it earlier. Smoltz, the first half of the year was two and two 11, and 11. But he but he be stuck with what Avery was getting. You know, Avery had caught his lunch the year before, and they said he wasn't ready. Bobby Cox said, "I don't care if you think he's not ready or not. He's my number four starter." Mm-hmm. Okay, Charlie Lebrand was a veteran who a lot of people thought was washed up, and he won 15 games. Glavin wins the Cy Young. And so we're all sitting there, you know, but that was the genius of Bobby, you know, to call them guys like that and get their mindset on what was going to happen in spring training. Mm -hmm. Well, I think right now I personally believe that the Braves have five starters that they could do that with. I'm not down there. I'm not in the dugout. I understand all that. But just from now from a – my eyes from and the experiences I've had, they got five starters that you could do that with and say, okay, boys, there you are. There's your five. You got five guys that, that, that I think are talented enough that you could tell that too yeah. and let them rock and roll. <clears throat> I agree. Well, thinking, uh, thinking of Bobby, we just want to continue to let people yeah. know our prayers and thoughts are with him as he continues to rehab and, and get, uh, get better. So I know you've asked about him a number of times and, yeah. Uh, we we uh, hope the best for him. But, yeah, I, uh, I put. Some, look, I don't I don't know if, if if the family looks at the text messages, but I've sent him three. I don't want to. You know, you don't want to bother somebody when they don't. They're rehabbing or whatever they're trying to do. They've kept it real quiet, mm-hmm. and uh, you know it, that that scares me a little bit. But I hope he's okay. And and I mean, he's, like I've, everybody knows, uh, besides my father, had the most influence on my life, a man, mm-hmm. than than anybody in my lifetime. So. Yeah, you know, I hope he's okay mm-hmm. too because he ain't gonna be the same with yeah. you know. So. Well, we hope to. No, we, we you know what? He's a stubborn, strong dude too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, he is. Yep. He is. Can I tell you a real quick story? Yeah, he chewed, sure. me, he chewed me out in San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> We're in San Diego, right? So it's ninety-one. We, I'm sorry, L.A. So we catch the Dodgers, right? So now we're tied for first place. So smoltzy has got a five-nothing lead. No, no, no. We're in the fifth inning. A couple of base hits, a walk, hit batsman, another walk. Now it's five to three with runners on second and third. And I went, Bobby goes, you think we should leave him in? I said, yeah, there's two outs. I said, yeah, I'd give him another out. He goes, I don't care. I, I don't care. I'm going to take him out. You want me to leave him in, don't you? I said, you asked me, you know, I don't, I don't care. I don't care. I'm cleaning it up. I don't care. I don't care. <laughs> he goes, I, I, I'm, I, don't, I ain't going to watch this. I'm going I'm to take him out. I said, well, Bobby, you're the manager. Do what you want. He goes, you want me to keep him in? Don't? I said, do what you want. <laughs> <laughs> so when he goes out to the mound, I take my hat off and scratch my head. So he comes back in. Smoltzy comes in, sits down, and goes, hey, what's going on? I said, nothing. Just you know, chill. And so uh, now Bobby doesn't speak to me the rest of the game. I'm going, I wonder who, wonder who ticked him off. Oh, I know. Smoltzy either made a face at him out on the mound or flipped him the ball or something <laughs> happened, you know. So I'm going, I'll find it. So we end up winning the game. So we go into the clubhouse at Dodger Stadium, which is, you well know, it's small. That little manager's room in the back. And then Bobby's going, that, you know how he was, that away, boys. Let's go. Let's go. Let's that away. And he goes, Leo, come on in my office and shut the door. So I said, all right, now I'm going to find out what really happened. And I'm going to have to tell Smoltzy to, you know, not to do anything out on the mound if you come out or tell our pitchers that. He come in and shut the door. He goes, don't you ever take your hat off and scratch your head again when I'm trying to make a decision. 
And I said, what are you, well, I don't know, what are you talking about? What are you talking? He goes, I saw it, I saw it. You, you. I said, you didn't want me, to, he said, you didn't want me to take him out, did you? And I said, well, you asked me, I said. <laughs> and I said, no, I didn't want you to take him out. He goes, and I'm getting a little upset, you know, he goes, he goes, I didn't either. I said, oh, you did? He goes, no, I didn't want to take him out either. He said, I'm going to tell you why I took him out. I said, okay. He goes, I took him out to tell the rest of your young rotation out there that we're in a pennant race now, and I don't want to see somebody falling apart in the middle of a game. He said, and I don't want to hear the word potential no more. I want results because we're in a pennant race. He said, I didn't want to take him out either, but I'm sending a message to the rest of the starting rotation. And I looked at him and I said, he says, what do you think? I said, I think that's the smartest thing I've ever heard. He goes, good, now get out of here. <laughs> and I cleaned that up a lot. <laughs> but anyway, so it, it, it turned out one. But yeah. see, that's – see, there's a reason why Bobby Cox is the greatest manager in the history of the game. When you listened – now, I would have never thought of that. Would you – you know, I would have never – oh, another one you would never think of was Steve Avery. We're, in the, we're playing the Cleveland Indians in the World Series. And, I, you know, we're up – we're up two to one, but I want to bring up bring Maddox and Glavin back a day early. And Bobby said, "No, I want to start Avery." I said, "We well, six and twelve, you know." And, and he goes, "Leo, two reasons why I'm going to start Avery. Number one, I want to reward him for all the great pitching he's done for us in his career. And number two, he said, I'd rather have Steve, a fresh Steve Avery out on the mound than Glavin and Maddox a day early." And I thought, well, that's fine with me. That's fine with me. Bobby, that's, it's Steve Avery, my golly. Well, that see, I would have never thought I want to reward him for all the, you know. Mm -hmm. And so then one of the great coaching moments of my career was Avery's pitching that game, you know. Change up, change up, change up, you know. Then a few fastballs. And he'd come in after the second inning. I said, Ave, I said, part of changing speeds is pushing the throttle too, not just pulling it. <laughs> he goes, Leo, they can't hit that pitch. I said, I know, but, you know, when you go around the lineup, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, none of this third time around stuff, you know. Anyway, I said, you go around the lineup, they're going to they're gonna start sitting on the change. You know, you got to push the throttle. Well, this goes on for five innings, and he's going back out for the six. I said, don't forget now, you know, push the throttle too. He goes, I'm telling you they can't hit that pitch. <laughs> and I said, well, if I was you, I'd keep on throwing it. <laughs> <laughs> so, see, that's smart on my part because sometimes the coach has to adapt to the mm -hmm, pitcher. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, and, you know, and he wasn't having a great year that year. No. He, was, he struggled. And, and, he, him and he threw six shutout oh, innings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was a great game. But, well, this has been fun. We appreciate you joining us. And oh, I bring back a lot of great memories, yeah. Mac. Well, we've got the uh, Fantasy Camp reunion tonight. You've joined us at Fantasy Camp. We'd love yeah. to have you down there. We'll check them out. So, we'll be up in the suite tonight, and I'm sure everybody will be excited uh, that you'll be here. And um, So, anyway, thanks for – Thanks for being here and it's been, a pleasure. Been a great time. Thank Absolutely. you so much, Leo. We appreciate oh, it. Oh, me All too. Right. That's fun.